This is the Evan Miller Report on Pundit Press Radio. Due to time-sensitive information from a delayed broadcast that aired the day before on SHR Media, some stories may be updated or irrelevant at this time. We hope you enjoy this broadcast of the Evan Miller Report on Pundit Press Radio from SHR Media. Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. I'm Jason No idea, but I can't wait to find out. In addition, thanks to divers recovering AirAsia 8501's black boxes, we will find out just what down the flight this time next year. Pennsylvania's gun owners are getting a new threat in our continuing battle against global socialism. A Canadian Looney Tooney conducted a huge Wall Street scam, and now he's locked in the Looney Band, eh? Verizon is suing one Kansas town for not approving its plans to build a new cell phone tower. Gee, where is Verizon? And Taylor Swift is giving back to her fans in entertainment. All that and more in today's Evan Miller Report, your conservative news source starting right now. Live from Southern California, this is the Evan Miller Report. Jason Miller with news and politics. Corey Evan with business and entertainment. This is the Evan Miller Report on SHR Media and Hundred Press Radio. Here now, Jason Miller. They're just having an ongoing technical issue tonight over at the Pundit Press Studios. And as I stated, they hope to be back on the air as of tomorrow. Anyway, welcome to the Evan Miller Report, your conservative news source. And tonight we're going to go ahead and start over in France, where French President Francis Hollande led a ceremony at the Paris police headquarters for the three officers killed in the attacks. For more on this story, we're going to go ahead and go to ITV News' senior correspondent Emma Murphy as she reports. There is no higher honor in French society and they could have made no greater sacrifice for their country. For the three police officers murdered on the streets they sought to protect, the Legion of Honor, a recognition of extraordinary merit. Ahmed Merabe, Lieutenant Franck Brinsolaro, Brigadier Clarissa Jean-Philippe, 
Au nom de la République française, nous vous faisons chevalier de la Légion d'honneur. As president, François Hollande must lead this country in its grief. Si la maman, le compagnon de Clarissa. But high office is of little use when it comes to comforting those in such pain. They took my daughter, says the mother of the murdered policewoman. Why did they do that? She wasn't ready to go. Trois policiers. Trois parcours. Three police officers, three different paths, three faces of France. The craziness of the terrorism which ended their lives had no color, no religion. It only wore a mask of hatred. The men who took these lives claimed to do so in the name of Islam. Those morning, Ahmed Merabe offered prayers that he, not his killers, would be the true representative of their faith. He is an example of a good French policeman of Muslim religion. 2,000 miles away, those who died in the kosher supermarket attack were also mourned as they were taken to Israel. A different religion, a different president and different families, but a shared agony. Emma Murphy, ITV News, Paris. Very sad story out of uh, France tonight. Uh, regarding the funerals of those three police officers and then of course the four people uh, four people killed over in that grocer uh, coast grocer over in Paris so very sad story meanwhile uh, tonight uh, friend, uh, friend uh, of the French National Assembly has said that the Islamic gunmen who murdered the 17 people in Paris had wanted to kill the spirit of France, but had failed. He was speaking after funeral ceremonies were held for seven of the people who died in last week's attacks. This week's edition of the magazine targeted by the gunmen is to show a cartoon depicting the Prophet, prophet Muhammad. Charlie Hebdo's previous depictions of the Prophet are said to have promoted the attack on its offices, which left 12 people dead, including the Santerial Magazine's editor and four other cartoonists. The cartoon shows the Prophet weeping while holding a sign, G. Us Charlie, I am Charlie, a slogan widely used following the attack on the magazine to express support under the headline, All is Forgiven. French lawmakers meeting in the National Assembly for the first time since the events of last week observed a minute silence for the victims before singing the national anthem, the Maralese. Mr. Ball has told them the huge unity demonstrations attended by millions across France on Sunday were a magnificent response to the violence before adding, we are at war against jihadism and terrorism. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. We had an uh, issue with Corey Evan. We had to bring him back. So hopefully we get him in the next couple moments. Uh, back to the story, though. Uh, Mr. Vallez said, as I stay, quote, We are at war against jihadism and terrorism, but France is not at war against Islam and Muslims. He announced a series of measures that draw on the lessons from the last week's attacks, including creating specific quarters for jihadists in prisons and tighter surveillance of the internet and social media. We must respond to this exceptional situation with exceptional measures, said Prime, uh, the Prime Minister, but ruled out exceptional measures which deviate from the principles of law and values. France's Defense Ministry has deployed about 10,000 troops at sites, including synagogues, mosques, and airports, in response to the attacks. And that concludes our coverage on France tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, stay with the Evan Miller Report. We'll bring you the latest on France as we get it tonight. Meanwhile, 11 Ukrainian civilians were killed and nearly 20 injured on Tuesday when a long-range Grand Rocket, apparently fired by pro-Russian insurgents, hit an itinerary bus in the separatist east. Local police said the rocket appeared to have gone astray after being aimed by the gunmen. 
at a checkpoint set up by government soldiers on the main highway connecting the rebel stronghold of Donetsk, Ukraine's southeastern coast uh, on the Sea of Anox. The incident was the deadliest attack on civilians since the rival side's Sunday much maligned September 5th ceasefire, but only partially stemmed the fighting and did little to resolve the insurgents' independence claims. Tuesday strikes also damaged Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko's efforts to set up a peace summit where his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin could personally sign a truce to try to end the ex-Soviet Republic's nine-month war. All right, folks, I'll be back in a couple of minutes with the latest on new talks from North Korea. But first, we send it up to Corey Evan. He has some of the day's other news, including some world news, including the latest on Air Asia tonight. More black boxes are found. Is that correct, Corey? Absolutely right, Jay. Final results of investigation on the crashed Air Asia QZ-8501 will be published at least one year later, an Indonesian official said there today. This according to the Xinhua News Agency out of Jakarta. Quote, a final report containing all the results of the probe into the crash will be released one year later, Tetang Kurniadi, chairman of the Indonesian Transportation Safety Committee, told a press conference in Pankalan Bun City, central Kalimantan. The formal investigation will commence after the release of a preliminary report, said Kurniadi, adding that the preliminary factual report, which has no analysis, will be released within a month. Tatang Kurniadi said a draft of the final report will be delivered to countries including France, Singapore, and the U.S. for evaluation. All right, folks, we seem to have lost Corey Evan. We apologize. Sometimes this technology is not perfect. So uh, if Corey Evan is still with us, we uh, we can't hear him. He can probably hear us. Uh, just have him go ahead and reconnect with, through those proper channels. Meantime, I'll go ahead and take it from here, Corey. North Korea on Tuesday offered to hold direct talks with the United States on its proposal to suspend nuclear tests and suggested dialogue could pave the way to changes on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, the U.S. State Department has rejected Pyongyang's, uh, Pyongyang's offer to suspend nuclear tests in exchange for a temporary freeze on U.S.-South Korea joint military exercises, but said it remains open to dialogue with Pyongyang. North Korea's deputy ambassador to the UN, Enya Mon Hun, told a news conference that the offer still stands. We are ready. The government of the DPRK is ready to explain its attention behind its proposal to directly to the United States, said the envoy. We are ready for that if the United States wants additional explanation about the proposal. The envoy indicated the talks could lead to broader engagement. If this proposal is planned to practice this year, many things will be possible, he said. I can't go any further, but many things will be possible this year. The United States, which has close to 30,000 troops permanently stationed in South Korea, conducts a series of joint military exercises with its key Asian ally, South Korea, every year. And, okay, moving on to our next story tonight, as we are still having our issues with Corey Evan at this time. We move over to Tanzania tonight where they have banned witch doctors in a move attended to stop attacks on people with embolisms. Home Affairs Minister Mathis Chinwa said there would be a nationwide operation to arrest them and take them to court if they continue to work. Albino people who lack pigment in their skin have faced attacks uh, faced attacks for their body parts, which witch doctors believe bring good luck and wealth. The Terence Binney Albiism Society has welcomed the ban. If we and the government come together and show strength as one and speak as one, we can deal with the problem head on, the society's chairman, Ernest Nechamana, said. I believe this way we can rid of, those, uh, rid of these incidents once and for all. More than 33,000 people in Tanzania are believed to have embolism. Seventy have been killed in the pa past three years, but only ten people have been convicted of murder. Mr. Chongwe said action to find and prosecute witch doctors 
would begin in two weeks time in the northern areas of Banswa, Gentia, Sinyangde, uh, Simnya and Tamboria where most of the attacks have taken place. All right, folks, moving on to Zimbabwe. Their, their high court has ordered to halt the eviction of farmers who claim they have been targeted to make way for a game park proposed by First Lady Grace Mungai. Mungai. Police had been demolishing homes for more than 200 families who had occupied land seized under the government's controversial land reform program. The government has denied that Ms. Mungai is linked to the evictions. She entered politics last year and holds a top post in the ruling party. The court ruled that the evictions were illegal and the farmers could not be forced out without being provided with alternative land. Lawyers for six of the farmers bought the case against the police and the Ministry of Land and Home Affairs, not Ms. Mungane, reports the BBC's Brian Howe, uh, Hugh from the capital Harare. However, the farmers say the police told them that Ms. Mungali was behind the evictions wanting to use the prime articultural land in Mashland Central Province for a game park. The farmers occupy Arnold Farm, also known as Minzoli Farm, near a dairy farm owned by Ms. Mungai and an orphanage that she set up. Over to Uganda, where a senior commander in the Ugandan militia group, Lord's Resistance Army, is, set, is being sent to the International Criminal Court for trial, according to a Ugandan Army spokesman. Demonic Orgwin, considered by some to a deputy to LRA chief, uh, Joseph Kony was taken into custody last week. Rebels in the Central African Republic said he was captured. U.S. officials say he defected. The LRA has abducted thousands of children for fighting and sex slavery. Both Mr. Onaguan and Warlord Joseph Kony are wanted by the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity. Pandy Agunda from the Ugandan Army told the Reuters news agency and ITN that the transfer would be made by the CAR, where Mr. Argonne, also known as the White Ant, had surrendered. And I believe we are reconnected with Corey Evans, so we'll go back to Corey Evans, and he was talking about Air Asia, and if I can ask Corey Evans to start that story in the beginning for our audience, uh, who are, uh, got cut off by that story in the beginning. Yeah, sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen, I had a little trouble with the phone, but at any rate, Sinra News Agency tells me that the final results of the investigation on the crashed Air Asia 8501 flight will be published at least a year later, an Indonesian official said there on Tuesday in Jakarta. Quote, the final report containing all the results of the probe into the crash will be released one year later, Tatang Gurniadi, chairman of the Indonesian Transportation Safety Committee, told the press conference in Pankalang Bun City, central Kalimantan. The formal investigation will commence after the release of a preliminary report, said Kerniati, adding that the preliminary factual report with no anal analysis will be released within a month. Tatang Kerniati said a draft of the final report will be delivered to countries including France, Singapore, and the U.S. for evaluation. As you know, folks, the cockpit voice recorder of Crash Air Asia 8501 was retrieved today from the sea and was on board an Indonesian Navy ship bound for Japan capital Jakarta for analysis according to the local press and when the developments of that story come to light we will bring them to you in a future report moving on to our next story from New Delhi from the Times of India amid drama a trial court today framed charges against the driver of a cab for allegedly raping kidnapping and intimidating a 25 year old woman executive in December last year Paving way for a speedy trial, the court also ordered daily proceedings from January 15th after 32-year-old Shiv Kumar Yadav pleaded not guilty. Yadav initially refused to sign on the charge order and argued with the judge, alleging he was not being given a fair chance to defend himself. Quote, you can chop my hands, but I will not sign, he said, adding that arguments on charges were not advanced in his presence and he was not given a chance to engage a lawyer. After repeated persuasion from his lawyer and assurance from the judge that nothing wrong was being done to him and all legal procedures were being followed by the court, Yadav finally agreed and gave it in writing that he was signing the order on charge at his own will. Please, just get to it, right? Additional sessions, Judge Kaveri Bowija framed charges against Yadav for alleged offenses. 
The incidents took place on the night of December 5th last year when the 25-year-old survivor who was working for a finance company in Gurigan was headed back home. Early, according to the charge sheet, the woman had identified Yadav when she was coming out of a courtroom in Tezazari District Court after recording her statement on December 8th of last year. Yadav was then coming out from another court where he was produced after his arrest. During the hearing, the court also allowed to drop a few prosecution witnesses after the prosecutor said they were not necessary, and Yadav also gave his consent. The witnesses who have been dropped include officials of Delhi Transport Authority and Mathura Transport Authority. The doctor who had prepared the potency test report of Yadav was also dropped. Yadav also did not dispute the recording of a statement of the woman by a magistrate, and that he had refused test identification parade proceedings before another magistrate. Both the magistrates were dropped from the witness list. And Pope Francis brought calls for reconciliation and justice to Sri Lanka today as he began, began a week-long Asian tour, saying the island nation can't fully heal from a quarter century of brutal civil war without pursuing the truth about abuses that were committed. The 78-year-old Pope arrived in Colombo after an overnight flight from Rome and immediately spent nearly two hours under a scorching sun greeting dignitaries and well-wishers along the 28-kilometer, 18-mile route into town. The effects were immediate. A weary and delayed Francis skipped a lunchtime meeting with Sri Lanka's bishops to rest before completing the rest of his grueling day. Francis is the first pope to visit Sri Lanka since the government crushed a 25-year civil war by ethnic Tamil rebels demanding an independent Tamil nation because of perceived discrimination by governments dominated by the Sinhalese majority. UN estimates say 80 to 100,000 people were killed during the war, which ended in 2009. Other reports suggest the toll could be much higher. With 40 costumed elephants lining the airport road behind him and a 21 cannon salute booming over the tarmac, Francis said that finding true peace after so much bloodshed quote, can only be done by overcoming evil with good and by cultivating those virtues with, which foster reconciliation, solidarity, and peace, unquote. He didn't specifically mention Sri Lanka's refusal to cooperate with the UN investigation into alleged war crimes committed in the final months of the war, but he said, quote, the process of healing also needs to include the pursuit of truth, not for the sake of opening old wounds, but rather as a necessary means of promoting justice, healing, and unity. Kind of sounds like the uh, the dispute between the Koreas, doesn't it, Jay? And it, I believe you've got a story about North Korea tonight, haven't you? Yes, we cover that story on North Korea, indeed, Corey. And sounds very, uh, very uh, like that story that we covered earlier on North Korea, indeed. Meanwhile, though, we have news in Guatemala tonight. Thank you very much, Corey. A few of the dates, other headlines going on internationally. He'll be back with a look at the national news in a couple minutes' time. A judge in Guatemala has ordered officials to verify the state of health of the former military ruler Efrain Rinos Montan after he failed to attend a court hearing. Last week, the 88-year-old appeared in court on a stretcher. He is being tried for a second time on charges of ordering the killing of more than 1,700 people during his period in office in the early 1980s. At a trial in 2013, he was sentenced to 80 years, but the ruling was overturned. Jen Ross Mott is the first former head of state to face genocide charges. He and the, his former intelligence chief, General Jose Rodriguez were tried in 2013 on charges of ordering the army to carry out a series of massacres in which 1,771 people of the Ixayimal ethnic group were killed. Over three days in the early 1980s, soldiers systematically killed hundreds of men, women, and children, shooting or blundering them to death and throwing bodies down a well. General Rodriguez was acquitted while General Ross Mont was Rios Mont was found guilty and sentenced to 80 years in prison. Less than two weeks after General Rios Mont's conviction, Guatemala's highest court threw out the verdicts and ordered a retrial, arguing that the accused had been left without a lawyer at the key stages of the trial. 
In Mexico, relatives and supporters of 43 Mexican students who disappeared in September in the southwestern state of Guerrero tried to gain access to an army base in the town of Angola on Monday. The protesters demanded to be let in to search for the missing students. They accused the security forces of colluding in their disappearance. Local police officers have confessed to handling the students over to a drugs gang, but they have not been seen since and their families are still searching. Prosecutors say members of the Guerreros Yundos, also known as the United Warriors drug gang, told them they had mistaken the students for members of a rival gang. They said they killed them and burned their remains, which they tossed into a river. A bone found in the stream has been matched to one of the 43 students, Alexander Moria. More remains are still being tested at a specialized laboratory at the University of Innsbruck in Austria, but they are so badly burned, it's not clear that they can ever be identified. All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and take a short break here on the program. Right. Despite lower gas prices, the world's economy is being seen as not good, even though we here at the pump in the U.S. can expect prices on average to dip below two bucks a gallon. In Wall Street across America, Verizon is suing one Kansas town because apparently they won't let them build a new cell phone tower, even though the citizens said they don't want it. And Jay, I've got a global story socialism story all about Pennsylvania's gun owners and how they're trying to fight back against a state ordinance that is potentially going to go on the hook. So what's going to come of all that? You'll find out in the Evan Miller Report after this break on SHR Media. You're listening to the Evan Miller Report on SHR Media and Hunted Press Radio. to the SHR Media Network. How you doing? John Grant here. When I'm not slaving over a hot microphone on the 405radio.com Saturdays at 10 a.m. Eastern, I check out Sean and Clint here at Sackheads Radio. We all appreciate the best political bloggers, writers, and commentators. We either get them on our shows or we make fun of them, as it should be. So check us out live Saturdays at 10 a.m. Eastern or forever on the podcasts on the 405radio.com. This is Tammy Jackson inviting you to join me on the Tammy Jackson Show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Pacific on the 405radio.com. Put down that remote and tune into the show that covers politics, Guns in the Second Amendment, Religious Liberty, Sanctity of Life, the Military, and more. I host newsworthy guests and work hard to be a conservative radio show that's not like all the others. So save Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Pacific for me, Tammy Jackson, on the 405media.com. Hello, I'm Paul, a student at Hillsdale College. Here is my professor, Dr. Larry Arn, on the separation of church and state. America's founders believed in the separation of church and state, in that the country was not to have an official religion or an official sect. But that did not mean that government was to be hostile to religion, or even indifferent to religion, as many today argue. In fact, America's founding document, the Declaration of Independence, includes both a reference to God as the author of the laws of nature, and a confident assertion that human beings are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. 
Far from being hostile or indifferent to religion, America's founders understood the theology of the Declaration to be an essential part of the education of citizens. This Constitution Minute was brought to you by Hillsdale College. To join the national conversation on the Constitution, go to constitutionminute.org. Hi, this is Rooster from Outcry Radio. Catch me here on Blog Talk Radio every Saturday night at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Or follow my blog at... Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. At St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, our discoveries have helped drive the childhood cancer survival rate from 20% to 80%. And we share our research all across America. I'm 80% sure I'll spoil my kids. I'm 80% sure I'll break boys' hearts. I'm 80% sure we're chick magnets. 80%? I'll take those odds. (laughs) Give thanks for the healthy kids in your life and give to those who are not. Go to stjude.org or shop wherever you see the St. Jude logo. Some of America's bravest warriors are returning home wounded. Here's one of them. Uh, My name is Norberto Lara. I served for 11 years in the United States Army. While I was on a combat patrol in Baqa by Iraq, a rocket propelled grenade took my arm off at the shoulder. When I came home, I felt alone. My family was around me, but I couldn't talk to them about what I'd seen and what I'd done. I remember just thinking, man, the way I am right now, I don't want to live. I was discharged from the Army, and I've been working with the Wounded Warrior Project since 2007. You don't have to be severely wounded to be with the Wounded Warrior Project. We do have a lot of guys that have post-traumatic stress disorder. Being able to share your story, I guess it kind of helps you wrap your mind around what did happen over there. Just because you've left the military doesn't mean your life is over. Because when these guys are coming home, I'm kind of leading and training them. Instead of for combat, I'm leading and training them to heal. If I come away with anything from Wounded Warrior Project, it's them giving my life back. My name is Norby, and yes, I do suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, but I'm okay. Don't suffer in silence. Contact WoundedWarriorProject.org. Let's get back to the Evan Miller Report on SHR Media and Pundit Press Radio. Welcome back to the Evan Miller Report, ladies and gentlemen. We're going straight into business, and it was sort of a lackluster day on the stock market. The Dow lost just 27 points, but still a loss at 17.613. The Nasdaq was down three points at 46.61, and the S&P 500 was down five points at 20.23. The World Bank today lowered its global growth forecast for 2015 and next year due to disappointing economic prospects in the Eurozone, Japan, and some major emerging economies that offset the benefit of lower oil prices. The global development lender predicted the global economy would grow 3% this year, below a forecast of 3.4% made in June, according to its twice-yearly global economic prospects report. World GDP growth will reach a 3.3% in 2016, as opposed to a June forecast of 3.5%, before dipping to 3.2% in 2017, it said. The World Bank said strong growth prospects in the U.S. and Britain separated them from other rich nations, including members of the Eurozone and Japan, which continue to face anemic economies and deflation fears. Among emerging markets, Brazil and Russia in particular weighed on the bank's global growth predictions, along with China, which is in a managed slowdown as it transitions away from an investment-led growth model. A Canadian man who allegedly told an undercover FBI informant he was conducting a lucrative high-frequency stock trading scheme has been arrested in Florida and charged with manipulating share prices on U.S. stock exchanges, according to the Globe and Mail. Alexander Milred, described as a resident of both Thornhill, Ontario, and Aventura, Florida, was arrested at his Florida home on Tuesday morning and charged with conspiracy to commit securities fraud and wire fraud. The wire fraud charge carries a maximum penalty of 20 years in prison. A statement from the U.S. Justice Department alleged Mr. Milred orchestrated a large-scale internal net international stock market excuse me, manipulation scheme using accomplices he recruited in China and South Korea. Oh, boy, this is becoming an international stock market incident, isn't it, Jay? Yeah, certainly is, Corey. It's really stinking real bad. 
stinks so uh, so bad stinks worse than the Franny May incident. Yeah, sounds like one from the movie, Ben, eh? Eh, that's right. What else you got for us? Ah, uh, yes, this one. You know how the Detroit Motor Show attracts car manufacturers and enthusiasts from around the world each year? Well, this year, Top Gear magazine from the BBC has their eyes on this one. Everyone was looking at the new Ford GT, but the Butch Santa Cruz concept pickup truck from Hyundai must surely rank as one of the Detroit Motor Show's more fun surprises. It's a world away from the Elantra, and given its prosaic pickup shape, it's quite a stylish thing, apparently. It's got central locking alloys, like a 911 GT3, suicide doors last seen on a Rolls Royce, and Mazda RX-8, and plenty of Sabiro yellow highlights, including the calipers of the Brembo Brake. Far from being the show car fantasy, it works, apparently. It's got 190 horsepower, turbo diesel engine driving all four wheels through Hyundai's H-Track all-wheel drive. In an apparent attempt to quash the Santa Cruz's unlikely coolness, Hyundai America's Mark Zipko read this out-of-the-market speak handbook. Quote, the Santa Cruz crossover truck concept meets the unspoken needs of a growing millennial lifestyle we call urban adventurers. What do urban adventures entail? Hyundai lists examples such as coaching a youth football team, volunteering for community projects, and taking the recycling to the recycling center. So it's a refreshing change from the life of the F-150 and the Toyota Tacoma. So there's no, yet, there's no word yet on whether it's going to make production, but it would be interesting coming from Hyundai because in Korea they are pretty industrial, so I honestly wouldn't be surprised. Would, would you be just? It depends. It really means the quality of parts and uh, quality of parts and the way they treat their workers. That's uh, yes, exactly for me. because yeah, because it does seem to be these days that making a good place to work makes more potential for making a good car for everyone. Absolutely right, and we all remember what happened with the uh, uh, with the current brands of Takata airbags. Ah, uh, yes, the Japanese brand. So, folks are still going to be quite on the edge as to the safety of their cars, I think. So, we will keep an eye on this and see how the markets shape up. Okay. Right, and moving on to national news. This first item in national news I get from the fine folks over at if my phone will work properly. The Washington Post, there we are. It was a commuter's worst nightmare. A metro train abruptly stops, goes dark, and fills with smoke in a tunnel in downtown Washington. The war was over, one woman was killed, and more than 80 passengers were suffering from respiratory problems and other health issues. But a day after Monday's ordeal aboard a Virginia-bound Yellow Line train, commuters returned to the rails. And authorities now believe they know why the train, which had just left the Land Plaza station, came to a halt about 800 feet into the tunnel. The NTSB said an electrical arcing event occurred about 1,100 feet in front of the train. The event filled the tunnel with smoke, the NTSB said. The agency said the arcing involved cables that powered the third rail. Arcing is often connected with short circuits and may generate smoke. There did not appear to have been a fire. Metro's Green Line resumed normal service Tuesday. Yellow Line trains were replaced by Blue Line trains and shuttle buses operated from Land Fund Plaza, which was reopened. The situation began to unfold shortly before 3.30 p.m. Eugene Jones, the interim chief of D.C. Fire and Emergency Medical Services, said firefighters did not immediately enter the tunnel to help riders because they weren't sure whether the subway's electrified third rail had been deactivated. But Jones said the delay was nothing like the length of time described by passengers. Jones said, quote, once we worked with Metro to ensure the power to the track bed was off, we made entry and made rescue. Passengers said the darkened cars quickly filled with smoke. Several riders said as much as an hour went by before firefighters arrived and led them out of the cars, escorting them back to the station. In the meantime, while the passengers waited in the smoke-filled cars, many were choking and some lost consciousness, witnesses said. 
According to the report, one person is dead and a dozen others are being treated for smoke inhalation as a result of the incident. In the darkness of the car, some riders screamed, people tried to pry open the doors to escape, and others were overcome by the smoke. They said the train operator announced to passengers that they should stay low to escape the smoke while they waited to be evacuated. Sound advice, eh, AJ? Ah, certainly is, Corey. When it comes to it comes to subways, got to be careful and just wait for those uh, uh, re uh, first rescuers there to come and rescue you, uh, and don't take any risk going out there by yourself. At least that's my general yeah, exactly. Opinion on it. Yeah, you don't want to mess with yeah, whatever unless you know that you're going to directly to the outside, you don't want to do anything like that. Absolutely. Unless you have a direct way out, don't even attempt to try to get out of that situation. What else you got inside the National News ticket tonight? Ah, uh, yes. I've also got a good one for you. This one comes to us from the SS Chronicle and the AP. In prison, former Detroit Mayor Quinn Kilpatrick's attorney argued today that his client should get a new trial, telling a federal appeals panel that the disgraced politician's trial counsel had a conflict of interest among other issues that deprive him of his rights. The three U.S. Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals judges peppered attorneys for Kilpatrick and co-defendant Bobby Ferguson with questions about how the issues they raised affected the trial outcome. Quote, that doesn't sound that egregious to me. Judge Richard A. Griffin commented at one point during defense arguments, the defense attorneys each had 20 minutes to try to persuade the panel to throw out the jury verdict from a trial that lasted more than five months. A jury convicted Kilpatrick in 2013 on corruption charges, including racketeering and tax evasion, and he was sentenced to 28 years in prison. Ferguson was sentenced to 21 years. A prosecutor said during the trial that Kilpatrick turned Detroit City Hall into a private profit machine by rigging contracts, demanding bribes, and even stealing money meant for the needy. Yeah. Kilpatrick attorney Harold Gurowitz said his client didn't get a fair trial for reasons including that his trial's attorneys were affiliated with the law firm suing Kilpatrick in a civil case related to the corruption charges. Assistant U.S. Attorney Andrew Getz countered that the attorneys had an ethical wall between the cases and there was no evidence of an actual conflict that affected the criminal case. Ferguson's attorney Susan Van Dusen attacked testimony from federal agents used by the prosecution saying they were allowed to use hearsay testimony and present the prosecution's case over and over on the witness stand. Guess again countered that there was no evidence of trial issues affecting the outcome. The judges didn't state a timetable for their ruling. Judges Eugene Filler Jr. and Helene White joined Griffin on the panel. Gore was set outside the federal courthouse in downtown Cincinnati as difficult to predict the judges' ruling based on their questions during oral arguments. He likened it to reading tea leaves, believe it or not. He said he's been in touch with Kilpatrick, who's serving his time in El Reno, Oklahoma. Who I think he's anxiously awaiting the result. And I think that's about right, because when you're the former mayor of a city and your entire career is online, trying to prove that you're being served the wrong message, I'm not wrong, sentence from the jury. A lot is writing on this, isn't it? Certainly is a lot writing on it. Corey Evan with some of the day's national news. And ladies and gentlemen, it's time for that segment we like to call The War Against Global that's been applied for centuries to determine the life of a human being 
Gosted told a three-judge panel of the 8th Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals, which heard oral arguments on both cases. North Dakota is seeking a bench trial at which it could present medical evidence that a fetus can survive for several days with medical assistance even in the first trimester. In the previous f f fillings, a doctor for the state argued that the viability begins at conception since an embryo can be kept alive in a lab and reinserted into the womb. The Supreme Court, meanwhile, has seen troubled today by the Obama administration's aggressive defense of its strategy for targeting job discrimination in the workplace. Several justices said courts should have some oversight to make sure the government is diligently trying to settle cases before taking companies to court. The dispute pits the administration against business groups that say the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is too quick to bring expensive lawsuits against companies instead of trying to negotiate settlements. Federal law requires the EEOC to try to informally settle the cases first, but the question is how much can a court peer into those negotiations to make sure the EEOC is not unreasonable. The government insists that courts should have no role in probing confidential settlement talks, while business groups want to be able to raise any ineffective settlement effort as a defense. The Obama administration's growing crackdown on claims of job biases has netted over $100 million in legal judgments and settlements from more than 50 companies since the year 2011. Justices on both sides of the ideological spectrum indicated Tuesday there should be some minimal way for courts to make Sure, the government is not being unreasonable without undercutting the EEOC's negotiating strategy, but they grew increasingly frustrated when government attorney Nicole Sarkozy would budge. And now we send it over to Corey Evan, and he has some more stories in our war against global socialism. Corey? Oh, yes, I've got a good one right here. A unanimous Supreme Court ruled today, according to the AP, that home buyers don't need to file a lawsuit but may simply write a letter if they want to back out of a mortgage because they claim their lender violated the Federal Truth in Lending Act. The decision came in a case involving Larry and Cheryl Jesenowski, a Minnesota couple who refinanced their home in 07 with Countrywide Home Loans, now part of Bank of America. They claimed the company failed to provide some disclosures required under federal law. The couple sent a written notice of rescission within three years after the loan closed, but a federal judge ruled that they should have filed a lawsuit instead. The 8th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed. Resolving a split among lower courts, the Supreme Court said written notice was enough. Scalia, Justice Fenton and Scalia excuse me, said the resolution of the case was simple because the Jesenowskis mailed the bank their notice before the three-year deadline. In the second unanimous opinion, also written by Scalia, the court upheld a mandatory 10-year minimum prison term for a suspect who forces another person to accompany him during a bank robbery or in trying to elude police. Ooh, trying to alert police. I'm glad he managed to touch on that one before he closed his statement. And finally, one from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's capital is facing a lawsuit believed to be the first filed under a new state law designed to give gun owners and gun rights groups a better chance at dismantling illegal municipal firearm ordinances. The lawsuit filed Tuesday in Dauphin County Court, named as defendants the city of Harrisburg, and various city officials. Houston-based U.S. Law Shield and two members of Pennsylvania chapter filed the lawsuit asking the court to stop Harrisburg from enforcing various firearms ordinances. They include ordinances that ban possession of firearms in parks, allow the mayor to prohibit public possession of weapons in a declared state of emergency, and require gun owners to report lost or stolen firearms to police. The 48-page complaint said the defendants possess and use their guns in accordance with state law, but they are now in danger of facing prosecution and criminal penalties, a.k.a. a load of Piers Morgan. So, is the American dream now impossibly out of reach? Is the threat of gun grabbing giving you a headache? And who swaps my sleeping pills with dirty caffeine pills? Stay tuned for developments in this and other items in our continuing battle against Thank you very much, Corey. Corey Evan, and myself, of course. 
uh, with tonight's Global Socialism. All right, folks, time to look at the D.C. news coming out of Washington, D.C. tonight, just briefly tonight. An Ohio bartender with a history of psychiatric illness was indicted last week on a charge of threatening to murder House Speaker John Boehner, according to records made available today. A grand jury indictment filed in U.S. District Court in Ohio on January the 7th identified the accused man as Michael R. Hoyt. A separate criminal complaint said Hoyt was fired last fall from his job serving drinks at a country club in Westchester, Ohio. In a conversation with a police officer shortly afterwards, Hoyt said that before leaving, he did not have time to put something in John Boehner's drink, according to the complaint. The court paper also said Hoyt told the officer he was Jesus Christ and that he was going to kill Boehner because Boehner was mean to him at the country club and because Boehner is responsible for Ebola. Oh, boy. I thought I seen it all. Now we've seen it all. Ladies and gentlemen, that is hit one local duck. Someone got that party music. Hey, local duck, why you turn off our party music? Ah, oh, boy. It sounds about right, Jay. Oh, brother. Okay, moving on to some less murderous news here. Republican and Democratic senators introduced legislation on Tuesday that would make it easier for high-tech firms in the U.S. to hire more foreign specialists in science, technology, and engineering. A bill by the Senate Finance Committee Chairman Orrin Hatch of Utah, which is home to some of the companies that will benefit, would increase the number of high-tech visas to 115,000 a year from 65,000. But that cap could go as high as 195000 in any one year if demand for workers was strong. The bill also will loosen restrictions on permanent resident status in the U.S. for some high-tech workers and their dependents. President Obama on Tuesday renewed a push to beef up U.S. cybersecurity laws after recent headlining grabbing hacking attacks against companies like Sony Pictures, Home Depot, and Target. During a tour of a war room at the Department of Homeland Security Cybersecurity Nerve Center, Obama said the recent attacks have highlighted the threat faced by financial systems, power grids, and health care systems that run on networks connected to the Internet. He said, quote, We've got to stay ahead of those who would do us harm. The problem is that the government and the private sector are always not working as closely as we should. End of quote. Congress has tried and failed for years to pass legislation to encourage companies to share data from attacks with the government and each other, but grappled with liability issues raised by companies and privacy concerns from civil liberties groups. And finally, former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee has accused President Obama and his wife Michelle of double standards in parenting, saying in, in an interview published today that the first family shelters their daughters from some things but allows them to listen to the music of Beyonce. The sharp rhetoric signals that he could run for the Republican presidential nomination in 2016. Huckabee would make cultural and social issues the cornerstones of his campaign. While promoting his new book, the former Baptist pastor told People magazine, quote, I don't understand uh, how, on one hand, they can be such doting parents and so careful about the intake of everything about how much broccoli they eat and where they go to school, and yet they don't even see anything that might be suitable in Beyonce's lyrics. He also said Beyonce's chirography uh, is the best left for the privacy of her bedroom. And in that regards, Corey Evan, I tend to agree. Because, man, Beyonce dan uh, dances like a woodpecker dancing backwards. No, nothing worse than seeing a dan yeah. da backwards dancing chicken, if you know what I mean. Right, and I can understand why my fiance Jennifer never watched any of that sort of stuff. She was sheltered, I guess, but with good reason. At least it kept her mind free of all those sort of nasty dance moves. Mm, absolutely right. Okay. All right, folks, it's now time for the latest in lawsuits across America. And now it's time for lawsuits across America. The cases are real. All rise for the Honorable Corey Evans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Said, said, said. We got to get this going, people. Tension between Bill de Blasio and NYPD was building long before Patrolman Benevolent Association President Pat Lynch accused the mayor of having blown his hands after the December shooting of deaths of officers Wenjian Liu and Rafael Ramos. 
as public advocates, as well as you angered cops by just supporting two city council bills that established an NYPD inspector general's office and prohibit racial profiling. As mayoral candidate, he cruised to victory on a police reform platform and acted on those promises almost immediately after taking office, it seems. In January, he announced that his administration would not appeal a federal court decision that the NYPD stop and frisk policy was unconstitutional. But his administration hasn't offered this kind of legal mea culpa when it comes to another contentious policing policy, the now defunct demographics unit. The unit gathered extensive intelligence on Muslim neighborhoods in New York and New Jersey, such as where residents ate and attended mosques without any suspicions of criminal behavior, the AP first reported in 2011. De Blasio did say on the campaign trail he was deeply troubled by the program, but a Wall Street Journal report from 2012 indicates de Blasio supported the program. And since the terror attacks in Paris last week, the program has received renewed public support. Former Mayor Rudy Giuliani implored de Blasio to plant police in Mons. And while the NYPD announced in April that it ended the controversial program, the New York Times reported shortly afterward that another NYPD unit aimed to recruit Muslim arrestees as informants. In addition, the de Blasio administration has continued to fight lawsuits challenging his decisions to end the demographics program. The plan of seek unspecified damages as a ruling that such surveillance is unconstitutional. And, and finally, Verizon Wireless is suing in federal court to force the city of East Lawrence in Kentucky to to Kent in Kansas and alleging the city commission violated federal telecommunications law when it unanimously denied a permit for the 120-foot tower. Sorry, I know I'm running over, but I just had to bring you that one because, as you know, we here at the Evan Miller Report are not fans of Verizon, are we, Jay? We certainly aren't, Corey. And due to time constraints tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we will not be covering any entertainment news tonight. So, Corey Evan... If uh, I will post it up on the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the Evan Miller Report. Right, but we do have enough time to say that I did go see the Liam Nielsen movie Taken 3 last night, and I thought it was a pretty good film to close out the Taken franchise. So, for those of you who are in... Who are in for a good uh, good spy thriller, that would be a good movie to see. Taken 3 is now in theaters. And ladies and gentlemen, again, as I said, that yeah, was a good film to see. Went to see it last night in the theaters after the program last night. So pretty good program, I should say. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, that is the Evan Miller Report tonight. For this, Tuesday, January the 13th, 2015. And I'm Corey Evan. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter if you'd like to do it. For all of us here at the Evan Miller Report, we thank you very much for listening, and we hope you have a good night. You've been listening to the Evan Miller Report. For more information about today's program, go to shrmedia.com or thepunditpress.com. Thanks for listening. Hope you tune in again next time.